Warning, this episode is going full speed ahead into spoiler territory for the Magnus Archives. I'm talking about spoiling basically everything in the show here, so if you have any intention of listening to it, which you should if you haven't already, bookmark this page and book it out of here so you can enjoy the series in its true glory. Also, this episode is going to feature in-depth discussions of fear, in particular as they relate to dying and the inevitability of the end that comes for us all. As a result, viewer discretion is advised. Oh, and a massive thank you to the Magnus Archives wiki, which was very useful in getting the info for this video together. Hey y'all, I'm Afton G. Cure, and welcome back for one final time to Entities Explained, the series where I explain one of 15 powerful fear gods from the hit horror anthology podcast, The Magnus Archives. We've made it, folks, to the 15th episode of this series, but if you'd rather start at the beginning, there should now be a link in the corner of your screen to take you to the full playlist. They aren't required watching, but this might make a little more sense if you do. If you want to join a group of people who are mostly alive, consider subscribing to the channel and make sure you stick around to the end of the video, because I have an announcement I think y'all are going to want to see. Anyways, thank y'all so much for keeping up with this series, and make sure you're ready to face the end. Also called Terminus, the coming end that waits for all and cannot be ignored, or simply death, the end is, as should hopefully be obvious, the fear of death. Compared to the other entities, the end is relatively simple, being the unending and persistent fear that you and everything you know will come to an end. Terminus is also strangely passive compared to the other entities, which makes sense given that everything eventually finds itself at death's door. Manifestation-wise, the end is generally associated with common cultural images of death, including bodies in all stages of decay, or in the case of mummies and other preserved corpses, a distinct lack of decay. Much like the dark, the end also finds itself often associated with cold, especially the cold of corpses or the sharp chill emanating from its veins. Death often operates in the realm of gambles and debts as well which follow from the social tradition of gambling with the reaper or dealing with the devil. Most notably, though, is the association between terminus, dreaming, and sleep. I'll talk a lot more about this in the analysis, because it's a fear that I know very intimately and find deeply interesting, but in short, sleep is a free trial of death. Dreams, meanwhile, are not far off from near-death experiences, so it tracks that death could find you in the former just as easily as the latter. Terminus has a surprisingly long list of associated characters, varying in connection to the end and significance, so I suppose we should get right to it. Starting with the manifestation most traditionally related to death, we have death. We never really get a better name for them, so I'm going to refer to them as Reapers to differentiate between them and the power they serve. What exactly the Reapers are is unclear, whether they can be considered avatars or something else, but we do know that they were once humans on the verge of death. When a person nears their end, they may be visited by a reaper, which can be challenged to a game to escape death. What the lucky individual often fails to consider is that escaping death does not mean regaining life, and when someone finally beats a reaper, either genuinely or through cheating, they would take the reaper's place, releasing the now unkillable loser. It's unclear how the Reapers choose who to visit, perhaps depending on the fear a person feels towards their mortality, but what is clear is that they are nearly unbeatable in their games. Challenging a Reaper to any game of skill is futile as they are perfect players, and even luck bends to favor them, making it very difficult to escape the end. The primary Reaper we know of is Nathaniel Thorpe, an American Revolution soldier who went into the Battle of Bunker Hill hungover and woefully underprepared, only to be shot in the chest. Mortally wounded, he ran from the battle fleeing to the cellar of a nearby farmhouse, where Thorpe met an ancient reaper, once a monk but now simply a skeleton dressed in forgotten robes. In a moment of desperation, Thorpe challenged the reaper to a game of Pharaoh, which turned out to be the fairest game he had ever played. Regardless, the Reaper still won, but Thorpe cheated at the last possible moment, in the process escaping death and taking the place of the previous Reaper. 
he would finally be released in a game of roulette nearly 200 years after his death, and being seemingly incapable of dying at the cost of losing several basic joys of humanity. It's unclear what happened to Thorpe after his visit to the Institute, but judging by the other accounts of Reapers, it seems likely that he's still around by the end of the series. Speaking of which, Basira Hussein and Daisy Tonner encountered what was likely another Reaper in Kensington on July 18th, 2014. Judging by the decor of his home, the man was an avid domino player, and the police had been called in to find that he had tried to escape the mortal coil several times. You'd think that after the first few shotgun blasts to the face you'd stop trying, but apparently missing most of your head isn't as much of a deterrent as it seems. Finally, there was the Reaper uncovered by Donna Gwynn and a team of other grave robbers in an undisturbed tomb between Cairo and the Red Sea. Likely untouched since the Fourth Dynasty, a mummified Reaper, having won a game of dice, was trapped in a copper-reinforced wooden sarcophagus. When the tomb was finally broken into by the team, the Reaper was released, only to quickly discover just how horrific invincibility can be. Both of these examples, given their distinctly non-skeletal appearance, are most likely people who were previously Reapers, but had been released after some victory, though neither is fully confirmed, so it's possible they are something else entirely. Another instance of the clearly dead reanimating can be found in an unidentified cadaver referred to only by the placeholder name Jane Doe. In another example of the power of spoken words in the Magnus Archives, this moving corpse was able to put those around it into full catatonia, using the simple phrase, the moment you die will feel exactly the same as this one. This phrase actually appears in several other statements, but I'll leave the implications of that for the analysis section. Anyways, this phrase seems to spark a genuine realization about mortality in the moments before the mind shuts down, but fortunately its effects can be counteracted by simply covering your ears. Only one person that we know of, Georgie Barker, has used this strategy to escape Jane's abilities, though even then, it still affected her. Rather than fully shutting down, though, Georgie had all of the fear drained out of her in a single moment, leaving her completely immune to the effects of dread and thus beyond the reach of the entities. While it's unclear if they can be considered to fully serve Terminus, the owners of the catalogue of The Trapped Dead, a book we'll get into much more detail on in the next section, and the spirits bound within its pages are likely tied to the end. As for who's in the book, I guess you'll just have to wait for the artifacts segment. Before we get to the traditional avatars, I also have to mention the woman who finds herself in a new grave on her birthday each year, whose statement John extracts while out for a walk. Given the emphasis on the passage of time and aging, this seems to be an end episode, but we don't have enough information for me to solidly say that it doesn't belong to the buried. Alright, on to the other avatars. Tova McHugh had a seizure, in the process falling down the stairs a month before her wedding, which sent her into a near-death experience. As she died on the operating table, an out-of-body McHugh shoved her spectral hands into the chest of a nearby doctor, giving him a heart attack but bringing her back. McHugh's life, full of charity, was, from then on, punctuated with occasional deaths and revivals, falling and cracking her head in the shower a year after the seizure, which she traded for giving an old woman a stroke, a severe allergic reaction which was exchanged for killing a homeless man with liver failure, a car accident given to a poverty-stricken child, and many more she did not share. The ability, McHugh realized, was based on how many individuals would be struck by terror at the sudden death. The more connected a person was, the longer McHugh was given for their life, sapping away the lives of the innocent to extend her own. The end's other one-off avatar is Justin Goh, who I mentioned last episode because Decker initially thought he might be a manifestation of the extinction. Go had made the genius decision to keep himself warm on a camping trip by bringing a barbecue into his tent which, predictably enough, filled his lungs with carbon monoxide. Go died in a hospital for 52 seconds before they managed to bring him back, though he awoke with images of some terrible deal still fresh in his mind. Go would then go on to poison several sleeping people with carbon monoxide, sending it straight into their bloodstream though he could only do this when both he and the victim were dreaming. 
Decker ran into Go while investigating the extinction, but figured he could do a good deed in the process. Taking a metal skewer from the kitchen of one of Go's victims, Decker lobotomized the dreaming avatar, removing his ability to dream and his horrifying death powers along with it. By the time Decker was done scrambling his brain, Go could barely talk and was dragged off by the police to a care facility where he would remain until his escape in 2015. Judging by the poison professionals, it seems his gifts came back too. With all of the other characters out of the way, let's finally talk about the most significant avatar of the end, Oliver Banks. Shortly after leaving his job in 2007, Banks began to have dreams of a dark city wrapped in black veins, pulsing and covering everything in sight. There were never many people in his dreams, but those that did appear were perfectly still, seemingly faded and bound in the dark tendrils. Every person wore an expression of pain and fear, and as it turned out, would die sometime in the next ten days by wounds that were symbolically represented in the veins constricting them. Life continued for Banks, his waking hours spent vending magical gimmick items and his sleep occasionally disrupted by prophetic dreams of lives not yet taken. The most notable of these was a dream where the veins pulsed with a red glow, leading him to the archives and the archivist, Gertrude Robinson, though his attempts to warn her under the alias Antonio Blake seemed to fail. The veins also started to appear during the day, though never in as great of quantities or as thickly as in his dreams. Upon touching them, Banks discovered that the veins were terribly cold, cutting through any cover and making touching them very uncomfortable. Fleeing from their impossibly cold touch, Banks moved to the countryside in an attempt to escape them. When that failed, Banks decided to try reaching Point Nemo, a point in the South Pacific that is 1,400 miles from the nearest landmass, lacking enough nutrients for life, and never has to be passed through by ships. It is also notable for being the perfect crash spot for spacecraft, which will be important later. Unfortunately for Banks, an area that's never visited by anyone is, unsurprisingly, quite hard to visit, so for years there was no way for him to reach it. Eventually, though, he learned of a research ship, which he boarded as Dr. Thomas Pritchard, whose identity Banks had stolen after he had been decapitated in a motorcycle accident no one else had witnessed. On that ship in the ocean, Banks finally got some decent rest, but that was all torn away when they finally reached Point Nemo. Giant veins wrapped the ship, covering the crew and seeming to lead just a mile away. Banks was first overcome by horror at the sight of them, but eventually realized what they wanted him to do. Somehow acquiring a gun, Banks shot Captain McAvery and guided the crew out to the empty spot of ocean where the entire crew, Banks included, were killed by a falling satellite. Told you that would come back. Anyways, death isn't often permanent for those touched by the end, so Blake came back and seemingly wandered around, giving some advice to comatose archivists until the change, when he was given his own domain, the corpse roots, and the title the coroner. He's also given the knowledge that everything, including the entities, will eventually end in the fear-heat death of reality, leaving only Terminus for a brief moment before it too starves, which is a pretty crazy thing to just be okay with. Artifacts-wise, the end is pretty sparse, so this shouldn't take long. Terminus only has one regular item associated with it, being the bone game pieces used by Reapers. Specifically, it seems that the psychopompic manifestations of the end leave the pieces behind when someone wins a game. The bone used to make the pieces is very old, to the point where the archivist accidentally destroys one such artifact when he tried to pick it up. While they can vary drastically in form and seem to be specific to the game that was played, we at the very least know of a pharaoh copper and several dice. It can be speculated that, if the individual Basira and Daisy encountered was a reaper who won a game of dominoes, then there would be some domino piece which lines up with the domino originally offered to Thorpe, alongside a pair of dice and a chest knight. Also, judging by how fluid this classification is, it's entirely possible that any other game components conjured by Reapers would fall into this category, though they seem more like extensions of the Reapers and their abilities than the pieces left behind after a game has been won. The other two artifacts associated with the end are both books with quite similar names. 
The Book of the Dead, aside from being one of the most generic names for an artifact I have ever heard, is bound in faded black cloth and filled with what seems to be the extensive descriptions of past owners' deaths, captured in gore-streaked, agonizing detail. The cruel deaths described stretched back centuries, with the accounts shifting from handwritten Latin to neatly typed English as the book goes on. However, there is another detail of this book that's worth mentioning. Anyone who reads the opening inscription, it seems, has their upcoming death written in the next page of the book. Attempting to escape this fate, or perhaps just the act of checking the book, pushes the end closer, and while the means of death change with each rewrite, all of them retain a certain grisly and horrifying nature. We know of five individuals whose deaths were listed in the book. Julian, who was likely a homicide victim, Christopher, who was dragged around town by a horse and had his skull kicked in with its sharp hooves, Alexander Willard, who was stabbed seven times and had his throat slit by an unknown home invader, Philip Doa, who was bisected by a train, and Masato Murray, whose exact death we don't know since he gave his statement before it could happen but who was, at one point or another, eligible for a tree spearing during a car crash, 19 hours of burned agony after a gas explosion, and partial decapitation by falling masonry on New Year's. I can officially say that this would be one of my least favorite artifacts to have in real life, and that's including all of the ones that just instantly kill or disappear you. Anyways, the last artifact of Terminus is, of course, the catalog of the trapped dead, used to bind spirits to the living world with their removed skin. The skin book is mostly written in Sanskrit, and the pages, much like the Book of the Dead, describe the violent deaths of its subjects. However, unlike the other end book, reading a person's page will allow them to appear in a spectral form. This ghostly existence seems to be painful, and the apparition it spawns isn't exactly the person, instead seemingly a copy or fragment left behind. Binding someone to the book seems to be a very intricate process, and if done improperly, can have very unfortunate results. Only one person has ever successfully bound themselves to the book, but that's getting a bit ahead of ourselves. The first owner of the book was Dr. Margaret Tellison, who ran a general practice out of her home and would occasionally kill her patients, tearing away their skin and using it to make book pages. Once they were bound, Dr. Tellison would force the spirits to reveal how to access their money, which a young Mary Key found to be a great waste of the book's potential. In her time possessing the book, Dr. Tellison killed several unseen people, a short smiling woman with curly brown hair who may or may not have ever been fully bound, and an old man. Shortly after the smiling woman was killed and skinned, Dr. Tellison was killed by Mary Key using a straight razor who then tried to bind her, though the process wound up creating what Mary called a dreadful mess. Mary would keep the book for much of her life, eventually using it to bind her husband, Eric Delano, after his escape from the Institute. In 2008, Mary Key finally figured out how to bind herself to the book, and although the ritual didn't seem to go perfectly, it was good enough that she could manifest from the book at will, appearing completely bald and covered in Sanskrit tattoos. While she seemed fully formed, able to interact with the living world, these periods wouldn't last and Mary would always wind up fading back away for a time. During one of these fades in 2013, her son Gerard Key and Gertrude Robinson destroyed her page, keeping her from her dream of deathlessness. The book would then remain mostly unused for about a year while in the possession of Jerry and Gertrude, until Gerard Key's death at which point Gertrude bound him to the book for unclear reasons. The catalog was then stolen from police evidence by Trevor Herbert and Julia Montauk, who, as far as we know, stayed with the book until their deaths, although Gerard's page was stolen and burned by the archivist. I think that about covers the catalog, although I'm just now realizing that I don't think I ever fully established that burning a page releases its spirit, so, uh, yeah, that's a thing. The end doesn't really have locations, since any space occupied by Terminus would just be empty and void of life. Still, I suppose you could argue that the hidden tomb in Egypt was at least designed around the end, and that Point Nemo seems in some way influenced by it, given the titanic veins, although that also might just be indicating the death of Oliver Banks. I don't know, there really aren't any pre-change end locations. 
Terminus also doesn't have ritual that we know of, although this one is actually for a reason. Unlike the web which never had a ritual because it was building up an escape route, the end never attempted a ritual because it never needed to. Everything dies eventually, and were Terminus ever to fully manifest, it would just leave a void world, cold and useless. Admittedly, this explanation does come from Peter Lucas, who, in the same conversation, was wrong about the mother's reasons for not undergoing a ritual, but his explanation does seem to check out. Or maybe the end just likes pina coladas too much to see the world destroyed, I don't know. Finally, we get to something the end actually has. Domains. Starting off with possible domains, the necropolis seems pretty Terminus themed, given its whole graveyard aesthetic and talking about the dead, but its themes seem more in line with the web or eye than the end. And that's sort of it for unclear domains. Death is pretty apparent when it manifests, and given that it seems people can't really die in most domains, it's pretty rare that overlap with the fear of dying occurs. The only clear end domain we know of, the Corpse Roots, is also run by everyone's favorite canonically hot avatar, Oliver Banks. As the only domain we know of where people can die, the Corpse Roots are an essential part of the post-change ecosystem, ensuring that eventually the entire system will come crumbling down. It's not entirely clear what they are, although it's pretty easy to assume that they're some evolved form of Banks' veins and people follow these roots, seemingly half-metaphorically, the entire time, anticipating their own death. The corpse roots are weird, and like a lot of things so far, I'll talk about their implications in the analysis, but I do think their statement format is kind of neat. Season 5 let the statements get a lot weirder, as you might expect from a Lovecraftian hellscape, but this has to be one of my favorite statements in pure formatting. The idea that Banks, now taking on the role of the coroner, is writing out a scientific analysis of his work to the eye is fascinating, and definitely says a lot about how the end views itself and the other entities in the capacity that it can do so. Speaking of which, let's talk about the role of Terminus among the things that were fear. Given that most fears can in some way be traced back to the fear of death, the end has a lot of thematic overlap with other entities, but it's unclear how significant those connections are. Starting with the slaughter, war brings about a lot of death, so the slaughter and the end wind up having a lot of similarities. In fact, looking at specific episodes, the parallels between Mag-7, the Piper, and Mag-29 cheating death are not lost on me. Another power with a lot of overlap is the flesh, although Viscera and Terminus share imagery more than theme. Specifically, both deal in bone, to the point where we even see the two being confused. When Mary Key took the books from Dr. Tellison's safe, she realized that only one of them, the catalog, was actually related to the end. The other, a small book of Sanskrit poetry, was connected to the flesh, despite dropping bones, which are a lot more end-themed than skin. In fact, the skin book also gives us some evidence for a connection between the stranger and the end. Both have to deal with skin, although, like the flesh, I suspect that I do not know you is only tied to the end insofar as the outer layer of a person can eventually be a piece of their corpse. The empty world of the end feels a little lonely or dark-themed, and the idea of loss is decidedly extinction-esque. Terminus's existential aspects are a bit vast, in the sense that life is insignificant when the scale grows enough, but death also feeds the buried in the form of caskets and burial pits. Fearing your own death isn't far off from fearing the loss of yourself, which takes us to the spiral, while the hunt is frightening because of the constant worry that you will become prey. Disease scares us because it accelerates the end, and Terminus can only generate fear in those who are distinctly aware of their impending doom, which knocks out the corruption and the eye too. That just leaves the mother, and dying is the final and ultimate loss of control. But I want to linger on the web for a moment, because it has a strange relationship with the end. In one of the few end-entity interactions we see, the spider intentionally sends Banks to a dying Jonathan Sims's bedside to motivate his decision. Of course, this is all in an effort to bring about the grand ritual and allow the story spinner and all of the other powers to escape into infinite realities, but it also ironically brings the mother itself towards the end. 
In the dying, post-change world the powers are trapped in, the hidden machination is as much a victim as anyone else, inevitably set to die like everyone and everything. If the Archivist Mag 200 plan had gone correctly, then the web would have collapsed, and the end would claim it too. All of which would have happened because it influenced the end. Ironic, huh? That finally brings us to the long-awaited analysis. To get this out of the way, let's do one last plot connection. In my storytelling metaphor, what does the end represent? Well, pretty obviously, it's the end. The close of a storyline, the death of a character, the end of a book, or film, or game, or video. It's the moment that you know is coming from the second you start a story. One of my favorite videos on this entire platform is by a channel called The Cursed Judge, talking about the role of endings in stories that never seem to really start. Called How Sitcoms Deal With Death, a big part of this video is devoted to the hatred that the Seinfeld finale got, because unlike most stories, Seinfeld never really ended. When a story doesn't ever have a conclusion, leaving the simple implication that the status quo will continue on, now unobserved for all time, there's something unsatisfying about that. Yet it's become almost laughable to end a story with, and then they all lived happily ever after, which, for the record, is exactly the same idea. The difference is, one implies closure, the idea that there's nothing significant left to see, while the other is simply a continuation that we won't get to see. So, what does this have to do with the end? Well, while it might often seem like a terrible thing, the endings of narratives and plots prove the value in conclusion. The idea that finality feels cathartic. I don't know. There is a certain appeal to an end, marked by the bittersweet knowledge that a story you've enjoyed enough to witness to the finish is coming to a close. There's definitely some connections you could make to life there, but I promised myself I wouldn't get too deep and philosophical in this one. Don't worry, there's something we're talking about in here that will definitely make me break that promise. In the meantime, let's talk about the one entity I didn't mention in my connection summary, which is the extinction. The extinction and the end are probably the closest entities purely because the extinction used to be the end. As Decker claims in one of his early letters to Gertrude, it's very likely that the fear of apocalypse was born out of the fear of endings. However, I think there's an important difference between the future without us and Terminus, which is that the first is very active and the second is very passive. The extinction is all about change and the fear that sweeping, catastrophic change can bring, while the end is all about preserving the status quo. Both of them feature a big change, but the extinction is all about the aftermath of that change, while the end is all about the before. The end is stagnant, it's constant, and it will wait for as long as it takes. Eventually, death claims everyone, so why be aggressive when everything is yours from the moment it's given life? Speaking of which, let's talk about how the end is actually going to cause the apocalypse. Yep, after talking about how different the end and the extinction are, I'm now going to explain how Terminus is going to terminate everything. Banks' statement is strange because it's so different from everything else. The realization that the world is slowly being eaten away and that piece by incremental piece everything will eventually collapse is terrifying. And it brings to mind the question of whether the end can fear itself. Does death fear the knowledge that it too will someday die? On the other hand, the reason that death actually occurs is, as the coroner says, that while this new world of fear reviles death as a release, the coming end cannot exist without its reality. The end can't exist unless everyone who fears it is acutely aware of just how real it is, and empty threats can only last so long. The post-change world is a closed system that the end, by necessity of its nature, tightens, while making it the ultimate threat to the new world Jonah Magnus, the Eye, and the Archivist created. Finally, let's talk about the TMA line that stays with me the most. Magnus has a lot of really good one-liners, some of which will pop into my head from time to time, but there's one phrase that has etched itself into my brain and I'm sure you've already guessed what it is. The moment that you die will feel exactly the same as this one. Simple, easy, and utterly horrifying. 
for reference, I'm a bit of a thanatophobe as it is. The concept of ceasing to exist at some point chills me to my very core, and I've genuinely lost a lot of sleep over thinking about what the process of sleep is. Not being conscious and fully in control of myself terrifies me, it really does. So when I say that this line stuck with me, I mean that this is among the things that will pop into my head in the middle of the night and ensure that I get an extra hour of insomnia. It's such a simple idea, and yet just hearing it. <sighs> TMA plays a lot with the idea that spoken words have a sort of power, and most of the time I don't get that, but I could genuinely believe that there is some grand revelation in that statement. The simple knowledge that dying might be just like going to sleep. That you can never pinpoint it, it just hits you, and suddenly, you're gone. More than that, if you spend your last moments awake, you'll perceive your death exactly the same way you perceive life. It will just happen, and there will be nothing special about that moment except for the fact that it will be your last. Honestly, for topics to end on in this series, I think this is pretty fitting. It's personal, and after a year of clinically talking about fear, I think it's only right to end it by talking about something that really, truly scares the hell out of me. So, thank you all for watching this series. It's been a blast to make, it really has, and the growth that Entities Explain has had for this channel is crazy none of which would have been possible without you loyal viewers sticking around. Obviously, I'm going to keep making Magnus content, but this series is really, truly, finally done. Speaking of other Magnus content, I have a big announcement, mostly just to motivate myself to actually get it done. Over the next month before Protocol releases, I will be working on a comprehensive guide to the Magnus archives. Not a supercut of Entities Explained, but a full summary and report on everything that happens in the series. I hope to make it so airtight that the only way to get more information about TMA is to just listen to the series. It's gonna be massive, I've already been working on it here and there since October, and I'm really excited for y'all to see it. It may admittedly have to come in parts, because I am genuinely concerned that it might wind up exceeding YouTube's time limit, also, I don't think my computer could render a video that long, but hopefully I'll be able to get it all together in one piece. As always, if I missed anything, please let me know in the comments, along with letting me know if you have any theories of your own, if you disagree with my takes, or if you just want to say hi. Also, consider subscribing. Y'all have been showing up in crazy numbers recently, and subscribing means you'll be sure to catch that massive video when it comes out. Thank you one last time for watching this series. I've been Afton G. Kier, and this has been Entities Explained. Good night, YouTube people.